As we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray. Holy and gracious God, open our hearts and minds and souls as we hear this reading of your holy word. May it comfort us and may it challenge us as we seek to follow you. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verses 22 through 34. In this scripture, the Apostle Paul and Silas have been arrested by a crowd and are going to be thrown into prison. We pick up this story in verse 22. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the last 12 years, I've spent a few days each spring with three friends who are also Presbyterian pastors. During our time together, we talk about work, we offer feedback and encouragement, we share good food and the beautiful scenery of Western North Carolina. Each year, we invite another pastor to spend a couple of hours with us. Usually, this is someone further along in their careers than we are, and we spend time hearing their stories and asking their advice. A couple of years ago, we met with a former pastor named Faye Avis, who talked to us about Soul Shop, an organization he founded to equip faith leaders and congregations to minister to those in their midst suffering from a sense of desperation, especially when that desperation is so profound it leads them to contemplate suicide. We met with Faye in a bookstore in Asheville. We got coffee and found a corner of the store where we could sit and talk. I was expecting we would just ask Faye some questions about his work and his ministry, which is how these conversations usually go. But Faye had something else in mind. He had come prepared with questions for us to answer. And the first one he asked was this, can you think of a time in your life when you felt a sense of desperation to the point where you contemplated suicide? One by one, we took turns answering that question. And in our group of four 40-something pastors, Three of the four of us could name a time in our lives when we had experienced this level of despair. Research confirms that our small group is consistent with society at large. Studies show 
80% of adults will seriously consider suicide at some point in their lives. Research also shows that identifying with a particular religion has no protective effect. There is no difference in suicide rates across denominational lines. What does have a slightly protective effect is not just identifying with a religion, but being an active participant in a faith community. When Paul and Silas are unjustly imprisoned in Philippi, secured in the innermost cell with their feet in stocks, you might think they would succumb to despair. But they did not. Together, they sang hymns and said prayers. They worshiped God and comforted one another. And when an earthquake shook the prison so violently that all the prisoners were freed from their chains and the prison doors opened up, Paul and Silas did not immediately escape. They stayed. They stayed long enough to attend to the person in this story who did despair, the jailer. After the earthquake, the jailer wakes up to find the jail doors open and the prisoner's chains broken, and he is horrified. Even if a natural disaster is to blame, he is the one who will lose his job and worse, his honor, if the prisoners escape on his watch. The jailer concludes the only option is to end his life. So he pulls out his sword and gets ready to do just that. But he is not as alone as he feels. Before he can make another move, Paul shouts out, Do not harm yourself. We are all here. We are all here. This is what Paul says to the jailer to stop him from harming himself. We are all here. Dan Savage is a well-known columnist, journalist, and newspaper editor. Back in 2010, in, a, in response to a rash of teen suicides traced to the bullying of youth who were gay or perceived to be gay, Dan and his husband, Terry, sat down together and recorded a video. In it, they shared their experiences with bullying during adolescence and how things changed as they got older and then after they met each other. When they made this video, they had been married for five years and together were raising a son. The point they wanted to get across to these teenagers who were being harassed is that life does get better and they should stick around to see for themselves just how much better it could be. When Dan and Terry put their video on the web, it went viral. Within just a few weeks, thousands of other videos were posted, all with the same message of hope. It gets better. What was so powerful about that project wasn't just the message that it gets better. It was the number of people who were willing to speak out publicly which sent the message to thousands of struggling teenagers that they were not alone. Do not despair. We are all here. A similar campaign exploded through social media a few years ago when the actress Alyssa Milano used her Twitter account to encourage women who'd been sexually harassed or assaulted to reply with the words, Me Too. Within the first 24 hours after she posted that message, the hashtag MeToo had been tweeted nearly half a million times, and that was just on Twitter. On other platforms, feeds filled up with women and men posting about their experiences or just writing those two simple words, Me Too. By the end of the week, there were more than 12 million posts with that hashtag. To see the sheer volume of people who have had these experiences and to discover that they include our friends and family members and classmates and fellow church members, it gives all of us a deeper understanding of the prevalence of sexual harassment and assault. 
It is also a way for us to communicate to someone feeling a terrible sense of isolation because of what they have suffered. Do not despair. We are all here. The book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, contains two creation stories, the second of which is found in chapter two. In this story, God does not create man and woman simultaneously, as happens in the first version. In this other version, the man, Adam, is created first and the woman is created later to be the man's companion. This isn't the creation story we tend to focus on, in part because it can be difficult for us at a time of heightened awareness of the destructiveness of gender stereotypes to imagine God creating women simply as a companion for men. But if we can let go of such a literal reading of the story, it has a deeper and profoundly important message. It helps us imagine how it might have gone had God created just one human being. After creating this one human being, God observes Adam, and for the first and only time in the account of creation, God declares that God has done something that is not good. So God makes creature after creature to keep this one human being company, but in spite of all these attempts, that human being remains miserably, desperately lonely. Finally, God makes a second human being out of the same stuff as the first, and that turns out to be just what is needed. This is not a story about gender, and it is certainly not a story about the superiority of one gender over another. This is a story about the degree to which we human beings need one another. It is a story about why it can be life-threatening for us to feel isolated and alone. It is a story about the power of the words, we are all here. In our country, we are struggling with what happens when we become isolated and alone. It has happened in our politics because of the way the news sources we choose tend to reinforce our existing views. It has happened in our communal life because of the ways our cities and neighborhoods and even whole states and sections of the country segregate us from those whose experiences and backgrounds are different from our own. But notice what happens in this story from Acts. A prison becomes a place of liberation and salvation for all the prisoners, but not just for the prisoners. Also for the one whose job it was to maintain the separation and isolation of the prison. Paul and Silas were in prison after being unjustly accused of bringing Jewish, that is, foreign customs to this Roman city. And yet, it is these outsiders who stay after the prison walls fall they stay to comfort the jailer, to care for him, and ultimately to set him free. This promise, we are all here, ultimately inspires the jailer and his whole family to join the body of Christ, this new community of faith. There are few things in life that cause us a greater sense of despair than the feeling that we are utterly alone, that no one else could possibly understand our pain or sorrow. And there are few things more powerful than drawing alongside one who is suffering and reminding them they are not alone. We are all here. We are all here. Here. 
We might think or wish that church would be a place we can gather with like-minded people bound together by shared beliefs. And while there may be some truth to this, when we read the book of Acts, we are reminded that from the beginning, the church existed to bring people together, all kinds of people, people of different ethnicities and cultures and backgrounds and education and social status and political persuasions. What brings us together and binds us together as the church is that we are all made in the image of God and transformed by God's love revealed to us in Jesus. But to experience that transformative truth, we need to draw alongside one another to talk to one another about what is really on our hearts and in our souls, to discover that what binds us together is much stronger than anything that separates us. For the last two presidential election cycles, the Black comedian Dave Chappelle has hosted Saturday Night Live on the Saturday after the election. This year, at the end of his opening monologue, he said, I would implore everybody who's celebrating today to remember it's good to be a humble winner. Remember when I was here four years ago how bad that felt? Remember that half the country right now still feels that way. Please remember that. Remember that for the first time in the history of America, the life expectancy of white people is dropping because of heroin, because of suicide. All the white people who feel that anguish, that pain, they're mad because they think nobody cares. And maybe they don't. But let me tell you something. I know how that feels. I promise you I know how that feels. If you're a police officer and every time you put your uniform on, you feel like you've got a target on your back and you're appalled by the ingratitude people have when you would risk your life to save them, oh man, believe me, I know how that feels. Everyone knows how that feels. Chappelle continues, I don't hate anybody. I just hate that feeling. That's what I fight through. That's what I suggest you fight through. You've got to find a way to live your life, to forgive each other, to find joy in your existence despite that feeling. There is perhaps no better biblical figure than the Apostle Paul for us to learn from as our sermon series on good faith conversations comes to a close. Because before Paul could say so quickly to one in the grips of despair, do not harm yourself, we are all here. He had spent much of his adult life denigrating others and inciting violence against those who were different from him. Until one day, Paul had a personal encounter with the risen Christ that convinced him once and for all that God cares more about our shared humanity than about any traits that distinguish us from one another. And so Paul spends the rest of his life having hard and powerful conversations about what it means to live out of our shared humanity. In today's story, Paul's words first save the jailer's life, and then they change the jailer's life. They reveal to him something so profound that he and his whole family are baptized, claiming their place in this new family of God. As a community of believers at First Presbyterian Church, as those who are bound together by our shared humanity and our conviction that God's love is for everyone, may we be a community that continues to do the hard work of showing up 
for one another, of listening to each other's pain and fear and despair, of respecting our differences, and most of all, of revealing God's love by always being willing to say these words, God is here. We are here. You are not alone. Amen.